Well, this is the third week of our message series, a series that we are calling Me, Myself, and Us. And a big part of the motivation for this series has been the reality that we've all been experiencing this past couple of months. The reality that the social distancing and physical separation that has been required to protect us from serious illness has challenged us in other ways. The past two weeks, we talked about something that those challenges have helped us to realize, something obvious, that this is not how we want to live our lives, but also something more, that this is not how we were meant to live our lives. By looking in the first week at a story from the early church, we discovered the surprising truth that God desires to deepen his relationship with us in and through our relationships with one another. And we realized that if this is true, our everyday life then is something in which God is directly involved. That in a certain way, he is depending on us, depending on you and me. And last week, we looked at how even though our own experience teaches us that we are made for relationship, and even though we might believe that God is trying to work in and through us in our relationships, that very often in our lives, in ordinary times, certainly we still have what we were calling commitment issues. We hesitate. We draw back from paying the price that will allow us to enter into deeper, life-giving relationship with one another. And one of the reasons we recognize for that is that meaningful relationship comes at a cost. And a big part of that cost is time. It takes time to come to know someone deeply enough to recognize their gifts. And time, perhaps not so much while we are under a stay-at-home order, but let's assume this is not a permanent state of affairs, time is something that seems to be in our lives in short supply. And so we considered why and how we experience this feeling of time being a precious commodity, of there never being quite enough time. We looked at how we try to compensate, how we use day planners, calendars, and scheduling to arrange our days and nights in a way that might allow us to accomplish everything that we want. We try, but in the end, even success in time management does not always feel like success. So we took a step back, a step back from busyness and from strategies to manage busyness, and we returned to the story of creation. We considered a God-given, or if you prefer, natural boundary that can structure our time and our life, night and day. A boundary that is not much respected in our current world. We saw that even our body teaches us the danger of not respecting that boundary. You can take a look at that discussion in last week's message on our website if you'd like to know more. And so we recognize that very often we are living in a way that doesn't allow us to have the life or the relationships that we would desire. And in conclusion last week, I left you a bit of a puzzle. I referenced another boundary that can help us, a boundary that, like night and day, we Christians believe is written into the fabric of creation. Now for some of you, I said I left you a puzzle, for some of you that might not have been much of a puzzle at all, especially if in trying to solve it, you kind of poked around in the Bible in the vicinity of that creation story we quoted last week, because that's where the answer is. Just a few verses beyond what we read last week about the creation of light and darkness, evening and morning, the first day. So here it is. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. God rested on the seventh day. There is your boundary. Now, just as, as we said when we talked earlier about God depending on us in our relationships, even if you don't believe in God, you are well aware that God doesn't need rest any more than he needs to depend on us and our relationships. He is God. He doesn't need us. In a certain sense, that's what the word God means. God, all-powerful, all-holy, all-knowing, self-sufficient. He doesn't need us, and he certainly doesn't need rest. So what is going on? Well, we Christians believe that in the Bible, we encounter God reaching out to us through the words of the human eyes. 
In our tradition, we have a word for that reaching out. We call it revelation. In Scripture, God is revealing something to us. He is revealing a mystery. In truth, several mysteries. Remember, last week we said that a mystery is a reality that, however much we come to know about it, always has more to reveal. Sometimes the mystery is that God is revealing in the Bible is himself. But other times, the mystery that God is revealing is us, you and me. And part of that mystery is that we are most in tune, most in sync, and most in harmony with our world and with ourselves when we recognize our limits, when we acknowledge that there are boundaries given to us that mark off the space within which an abundant, joyful, fruitful life may be lived. The creation story sets out some of those boundaries, the boundary of night and day that we talked about last week. And today, as I mentioned, we encounter another boundary, what our scripture quote called the seventh day, and what religious tradition has called the Sabbath, a day of rest. But we don't need to be religious to recognize the value of that boundary. First, the simple phys real physical reality is that we need rest. Rest within the daily cycle provided by night and day, but also rest within the larger expanses of our life, weeks, months, years. Now I'd like to tell you a story. It happened long, long ago in a parish far, far away. Okay, it happened here at St. Pius and it happened a couple of weeks ago and it happened to me. But still, I'd like to tell you a story. One of the challenges that I experienced as we entered into this time of self-isolation was that, and maybe you experienced this as well, one day seemed exactly like the next. Outside events and activities faded away and it turned out that without knowing it, I had been counting on them to give my life structure. In normal times, our parish office is closed on my day off. So if I wake up that day here in, in uh, Brantford, things are different. But now, our parish office was closed every day. So how was I supposed to know that things were different? That it was time for a change of pace? That it was time to stop thinking about how we can improve the live stream? stream how we might replace the bulletin with an email? How we might somehow stay in touch when we can no longer come together on Sunday? How was I supposed to know? Well, in one sense, that question is quite silly. If you had asked me, even at the time, whether I needed to take time off, I would have said, of course, yes, absolutely. But in another sense, it turned out it wasn't such a silly question after all, because the first two weeks, and indeed it might have been three, for that time, I didn't take a day off at all. And in some ways, isn't that story a miniature version of the lives that we all have been living? Running from one thing to the next, rarely stopping to look around and realize where we are. In that light, when I, turn, at least, turn back to the creation story, to the idea of God resting from his work in creation, it seems like God is reaching out to me and revealing something about myself that I don't know, or at least that I sometimes forget. And I don't think I am alone. Too often we forget that the cycle and structure of our days and weeks is there for a reason, to give us the rest and space in our life that we need. And we also forget that just as having life-giving, fruitful relationships depend on proper rest and sufficient time, it also needs and even demands shared time, time spent with other people. In other words, for a relationship to happen, my free time and yours have to line up. And strangely enough, once upon a time, that was the law. Some younger people watching this may not know that less than 30 years ago, Retail stores and businesses in Ontario, with rare exceptions, were required to be closed on Sunday. Don't get me wrong, a pluralistic society and Sunday shopping seem very much to be here to stay. I'm not suggesting that we lobby to stop Sunday shopping. But it is always better that we think about our life and make intentional choices rather than just let the life we are already living choose our future for us. And so, if we believe that we are made for relationship, and we believe that our relationships are necessary for us to live our fullest, most joyful and fulfilling life, we need to take action. 
I want to start with what I just mentioned, with lobbying. Not lobbying government, I'm going to lobby you. I'm going to pressure you. Let's put it more politely, I'm going to invite you to do what you need to do to create a Sabbath day in your life. One day a week for rest. Do it for yourself personally if you are alone, but try to do it as a family if you are so blessed. Just try it for a month. And if you find that too easy in these times, try and hang on to that when we return to something a little more what we would call ordinary. Now, for we Christian Sunday is the best option. But if another day is easier to accomplish, choose that day. Priests in this part of the world have traditionally used Monday as a day of rest. That doesn't mean we ignore Sunday, nor should you. It just means we do what we are able. And so can you. For some of us, this is relatively simple. For others of you, I suspect, some very real, very practical objections immediately come to mind. I'm not denying that. But either way, we need to take that step back and ask ourselves, is the current situation of my life and my time really what is best for me? For my purpose in life? Is it best for those whom I love? Is it best for my relationships? And if the answer is no, we need to take at least a step, and maybe it's just a small step at first, maybe we can't do the whole thing all at once, but we need to take that step. A Sabbath day and the time it gives is that important. When he was Pope, St. John Paul II wrote a letter to the church about the Sabbath titled Dies Domini. All these things are titled in Latin for some reason. That means the day of the Lord. And in it, he says this. Through Sabbath rest, daily concerns and tasks can find their proper perspective. The material things about which we worry give way to spiritual values. In a moment of encounter and less pressured exchange, we see the true face of the people with whom we live. Even the beauties of nature, too often marred by a desire to exploit, which turns against man himself, the beauties of nature can be rediscovered and enjoyed to the full. In other words, as we have already seen, we need the time in our life that a weekly Sabbath provides. We need it for the sake of our physical well-being, but also to grow spiritually in relationship with one another, to see one another's true face, as St. John Paul II puts it, and even to grow in our relationship with nature, with creation. As we established last week, for we Christians, work is good, but there is a proper order to the many goods that are part of our life. And there are many goods that are part of our life. Very often, though, we do not stop to reflect on what the proper ordering of those gifts might be. And when that happens, the Sabbath begins to seem to us an impossible dream, something that could never be accomplished. The Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches us how having a Sabbath can challenge that experience, that feeling. The Sabbath, it says, brings everyday work to a halt and provides a respite. It is a day of protest against the servitude of work and the worship of money. A day of protest. I'll bet that when you clicked on the live stream today, you didn't think you're gonna be asked to join a protest movement. But this isn't the kind of movement that marches through the streets carrying signs and chanting. Rather, it is a protest movement whose members quietly make intentional choices to put first things first. And then, always politely, to say no thank you when we are asked to put other things in our life in a higher place than they should be. Observing a Sabbath day does that. It is also, and here we come back to some of those worries and concerns that might have come to you when I first suggested this idea, it is also an act of trust in God's care for you. Think about it. We come to trust our friends and family by observing that they are worthy of our trust. They listen to us when we complain or when we have been hurt. They remember us when we are away. They comfort us. You can count on them. Making room for your life in a Sabbath, which might come at a cost, will not only make room for life-giving relationships with your friends and family, it will also give God a chance to show you that you can trust him, to provide for you. And to trust in God is to have faith. 
And here's something I know about you. You have faith. I know that because faith, as we heard in our last series, is a gift and God freely gives. You have faith. It might be very small, the size of a mustard seed, as Jesus says in the Gospels. It might be so small that you really wonder if it even exists. But even if it is small, you can do great things. You can choose to trust God. You can choose to depend on him to provide for you in some new way, in some new part of your life. And you can create some breathing room, some margin in your life. You can find the time you need, or at least begin to find that time to deepen and grow in your relationships, to make your life happier and more fulfilling. That's your homework. Begin to find the time for a happier, more fulfilling life. Now, as I've already discussed at some length, we are made for relationships. And the boundaries of night and day and the Sabbath aren't the only way that God helps us to become who we're, we were made to be. Today, as I mentioned at the beginning of Mass, we celebrate the great solemnity, the great feast of Pentecost. And Pentecost, as I also mentioned, is often referred to as the birthday of, a, of the church. And as we saw in that first reading, the descent of the Holy Spirit on the apostles was quite the extravaganza. There was noise, there was a great wind, there was tongues of fire descending, but it was much more than some kind of cosmic firework show. It was substance, not flash. Receiving the gift of the Spirit changed the apostles. It changed the church. It changed the world. Much of our civilization could trace its roots back to that moment. Many of the things we hold most dear, respect for the human person, the dignity of the human person, equality, many of those things flow directly from our Christian inheritance. And so that moment of Pentecost, the moment we're commemorating today, changed the world. It changed the world by changing, in the first instance, relationships. As they received the Spirit, the apostles moved from a fearful, inward-looking relationship with each other. They locked themselves in a room, remember, to a joyful, outward-looking relationship, not just with each other, but with the world. And that's who we're called to be. The gift of the Spirit can still change our world, perhaps at first in a quieter way, by changing us. It can drag us out of self-involvement and self-absorption into genuine care for the good of others, for their spiritual good, yes, which is what you would expect of Christians, but also for their physical well-being, which you should also expect. Remember that story for the first week of Peter and John going down to Samaria and what we said, truly human relationships engage us body and spirit and relationships in faith and sacraments are relationships with God, but they are also truly human relationships. They are how communion is built among, and among us. Growing and deepening those relationships helps us to become the person we were meant to be, the person we want to be. And that brings us a great gift, peace. That was the gift that the apostles told the apostles he was giving them in our gospel story. Remember? Jesus said to them, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit, Jesus says. Receive the gift of life-giving relationship and peace. It's a gift he wants us all to have, but it's a gift he also wants us and expects us to share. We'll talk about that next week.